In this video, we're going to take a look at using that utility maximization model to see where demand curves come from. We're going to think about um, how people respond to changes in income, how people respond to changes in price, and remember the income and the price show up in that utility maximization model. They sh it show, each of them show up in the um, budget constraint. And we talked about how the budget constraint changes when um, price level changes and when income changes. The other thing that we're going to be able to do with this model is that we're going to be able to think about what the income and substitution effects look like. And, and that's actually very interesting. So let's start by taking this utility maximization model and thinking about what happens when income changes. So Let's um, start with quantity of good X on our horizontal axis, quantity of good Y on our vertical axis. Let's put a budget constraint up here. I'm not going to worry about any particular numbers right now. Let's just suppose that there's our budget constraint. And let's label that initial budget constraint BC1. I'm going to use that notation to indicate budget constraints because in this this section of material we're going to be moving these budget constraints around a lot. Let's suppose we start at an optimal point where the consumer is at point A. Here's an indifference curve, we'll call it U1. That indifference curve is just tangent to that budget constraint at point A. And the coordinates of point A tell us how much good X and how much good Y the consumer is consuming. So this we'll call it QXA and we'll call this QYA. So that point A is a point that's on the budget constraint. It's an affordable point and it is the one point that allows the consumer to get as high as possible on their utility function. It allows them to reach the indifference curve that is farthest away from the origin. Now, let's suppose that income increases. So we're going to start at A, and then suppose income increases. Income goes up. We saw in our previous videos that an increase in income We'll shift this budget constraint out, but it won't change the slope. Remember, the slope is determined by the relative price of good X. It's the price of good X divided by the price of good Y. So when income increases, our budget constraint is going to move out, and it's going to move out parallel to itself. So that one's a little wavy, but the idea here is that this one and this one have the exact same slope. This we'll call budget constraint 2. So income increases, that takes us to budget constraint 2. Now, what we see is that there are a whole bunch of bundles out here that are affordable. Now point A is inside the budget constraint, so the consumer's not going to stay at point A. This increase in income is going to allow them to move higher on their utility function. It's going to allow them to move to an indifference curve that's farther away from the origin. And so we're going to end up with a new point of tangency right out here, and we'll call it point B. But what we want to do is we want to keep in mind that when income goes up, whether or not demand for a good increases or decreases depends on whether or not that good is a normal good or an inferior good. So what we're going to draw in this picture is we're going to assume both goods are normal goods. Assume both goods are normal goods. What that means is when we move to this new point of tangency, this new point of tangency has to occur at a place that is somewhere to the northeast of point A. Let's put it someplace like point B. So we move to a higher indifference curve, and 
at that new indifference curve, it's going to be just tangent to that budget constraint. We'll call this one U2. And if we look at the coordinates of that point B, we see that the consumer responds to that increase in income by increasing the amount of good X. Here's QXB and here's QYB. The amount of good X that they bought went up and the amount of good Y that they bought went up. Both of these goods are normal goods. Now, where we put that point of tangency depends on, at its most basic level, it depends on the shape of the utility function. But what we want to do is illustrate where that tangency would be for normal goods. So let's do it now for inferior goods. So let's think about what would happen if one of these goods was an inferior good. So let's draw essentially the same picture. We're going to start, let's put QX here, QY. Let's have a budget constraint here, an initial point of tangency at a point. Here's your indifference curve U1. Here's budget constraint 1. Here's point A. Here's the quantity of good X at point A. And here's the quantity of good Y at point A. So same story essentially, but we're going to have one of these goods be a normal good. So now let's suppose income increases. Let's draw my new budget constraint. So here's my new budget constraint BC2. Now there are, are a whole bunch of bundles that are affordable that would allow the consumer to move to a higher indifference curve. But let's suppose that good X is an inferior good. Suppose good X is inferior. So what we need is a situation where the consumer moves to a new point where they consume less good X. We've had an increase in income but the consumer needs to respond by buying less good X. So we need good X to actually go down. What that means is my new point of tangency has to be somewhere this side of point A. It needs to be something up here like point B. If I were to have a point of tangency right up there at point B, and remember these indifference curves can't cross, so that means my indifference curves have to be very close over here and it's going to have to come down and just be tangent right there at point B and then move off something like that. There is an indifference curve that would be tangent at point B. That new indifference curve doesn't cross the old indifference curve, so I haven't violated any of the properties of indifference curves. But now when we look at the coordinates of this point B, what we see is that the amount of good X has fallen. Here's QXB. We've had a decrease in good X, but we've had an increase in good Y. Here's QYB. Increase in good Y, a decrease in good X. So that's what the picture would look like if good X was an inferior good. If we wanted to make good Y an inferior good, then that means our new point of tangency would have had to have been someplace right down here because we need our point B to be some place where the consumer buys less good Y and more good X. So if good X is inferior, your point of tangency is going to be to the left of point A. If good Y is inferior, your new point of tangency is going to be below point A, somewhere down in this range right down there. So that gives you an idea of what an inferior good looks like, at least what the the utility function would have to look like. So let's think about three-dimensionally what this utility function lo would look like. This utility function in three dimensions would be relatively slowly sloping in this direction but very steep in this direction. That's what a three-dimensional utility function would need to look like for good X to be inferior. Let's also ask this question, is it possible to draw a picture where both good X and, bo and good Y are inferior? And the answer is no, because what we would have to have happen for both of these goods to be inferior, when we increase income, we would have to buy less of each good. That means our new point 
of tangency would have to be somewhere down here. So all that means is you can't have a situation where every good is inferior. Okay? Turns out that you, at least in a, a, a model where you have two goods, one of them has to be a normal good. Also turns out, if you think about it, that every good has to be normal at very low levels of income. You can't start out with none of a good. Let's say you have zero income. If we took your income to zero, that would pull your budget constraint all the way back to where it just went right through the, the uh, origin. From that point, if we gave you some income, both goods have to be a normal good. If we started with nothing and gave you some income, you can't buy less than zero. So to buy less of something, you have to already be buying a positive amount. That means every good is normal at very low levels of income. Okay. Let's talk for just a second about income elasticity and then we'll come back to take another look at this picture. If we think about income elasticity, remember that the income elasticity looks like this. Income elasticity of demand, there's the notation that we use. It's equal to the uh, change in quantity when you change income multiplied by income divided by Q. Sometimes we write these with the Greek deltas right there. You probably, I probably earlier wrote it both ways. For normal goods, what we know is that if you've got a normal good, the income elasticity is going to be positive. Income elasticity of demand is a positive number. For an inferior good, the income elasticity of demand is a negative number. We've talked about that before. So what we're seeing here is that the sign of the income elasticity is the same as the sign of the income effect. For the normal good, the income effect here is that you buy more of the normal good. But for the inferior good, you buy less. And so that's why that elasticity would be negative for good X. It's the sign of the elasticity is the same as the sign of the income effect. Let's talk about now what we call an income expansion path. Actually, let's clear this off and then we'll take a look at the income expansion path. So an income expansion path is a convenient way of looking at how a consumer responds to a change in income. So let's take a look at what, how this looks and how we can use it. So if we think about our quantity of good X down here, quantity of good Y up here, let's draw a budget constraint where the consumer doesn't have very much income. So if they don't have very much income, then the budget constraint is going to be very close to the origin because they can't afford very many bundles. We can still look at where the indifference curve would be tangent to that budget constraint. Let's suppose it happens um, down here at point A. I'm going to draw a little indifference curve, we'll call that point A. So we can see, I'm not going to draw the coordinates of point A, but this would be the amount of good X and this would be the amount of good Y right there. Now let's give them some more income. So if we give them some more income, the budget constraint will shift out parallel to itself. They'll be able to reach a higher indifference curve. Let's suppose that they now reach an indifference curve right out here at point B. So there's their new optimum point. And so clearly goods X and good y, good y are normal goods because they're going to buy more good X and more good Y. Let's increase income again. So let's shift that budget constraint out. Each of these shifts, I'm trying to draw them parallel to each other. So this is, has the same slope as that and that. Not sure I'm succeeding perfectly, but let's suppose we look at where this indifference curve would be tangent. Suppose it happens right here at point C. And essentially we can continue this. We can draw another increase in income. And we can look at where the tangency would be. And let's suppose it happens right here at point D. 
and then let's do another increase in income. And this point, I'm going to stretch this. Let's make this point of tangency somewhere right in here. We'll call it point um, E. And then let's uh, do another increase in income. And let's suppose this one's tangent right up here. Comes in and just touches right there. And we call that point F. Now, if we were to connect, let me do it in a different color. If we were to connect all of those points, A, B, C, D, E, and F, with a line out of the origin, we get what we call the income expansion path. So if they have zero income, they can consume zero good X and zero good Y. So with zero income, that's where your optimal point would be. And then if we just start to connect these, we can see where the consumer optimal point would be. Now, keep in mind that none of those indifference curves are crossing each other. I haven't violated any of the uh, assumptions of consumer preferences or the characteristics of indifference curves. What we're seeing here is that over this range, both goods are normal goods, but once we start getting up into this range, all of a sudden good X starts to turn into an inferior good. And so this income expansion path starts to bend back on itself. And as we increase incomes back in, in this range, the consumer's buying less and less good X. So over this range, they're both normal goods, and then good X becomes inferior. Good Y is always a normal good, right? It's its quantity is increasing every time we increased income. So this is an income expansion path. Let's talk now about an angle curve. So if we think about an angle curve, it's named after, you can probably guess, an economist named Engel. I think his name was Ernst Engel. Um, Basically, the Engel curve is a different way of looking at what we're seeing in this picture. We're seeing the impact of a change in income on both goods at the same time. With an Engel curve, you focus only on one good at a time. So let's draw the Engel curve for both of these goods. The Engel curve has income on the vertical axis and the good the quantity of the good on the horizontal axis here will be the angle curve for good X. Down here we'll put the angle curve for good Y. So here's quantity of good Y. Here's income. So at zero income, this person bought zero good X. And at zero income, they bought zero good Y. So there's a point on the angle curve. We increased income up here to this, whatever the income that corresponds to that budget constraint, and we saw that they bought more good X and more good Y. So in terms of good X, when we increased income, they bought more good X, so we got a point something like that. Same with good Y. When we increased income, they bought more good Y, we got a point right there. And then when we increased income again, they bought more good X and more good Y. So we got another point up here that would correspond to point B and another point here that would correspond to point B. Then we increased income again, same thing. More good X, more good Y. And then, so this one's corresponding to point A, B, C. This one also corresponds to A, B, C. Then we got point D. We increased income, but notice that it looks in my picture like we bought just a little bit more good X. So we increased income and bought just a little more good X, not much. We increased income and bought a lot more good Y. So that one's somewhere out there. That one corresponds to point D. And then we increased income from D to E and we bought less good X. So that point's going to be somewhere over here. That corresponds to E. We bought a lot more good Y. That corresponds to E there. 
and then finally up to F, we increased income and bought a little bit less good X, so F is somewhere right in here. And we bought a lot more good Y, so that one's somewhere up here. So if we connect these points, we get something that tells us a very similar story to what this tells us, but we're looking at it differently. So there's the angle curve for good X, here's the angle curve for good Y. Anytime an angle curve bends back on itself, if this one were to, instead of continuing to go up, if it were to um, bend back in this direction, then good Y would become an inferior good. But remember, you can't have both goods being inferior. So because we've got good X inferior in this picture, good Y would never bend back on itself, not here. I guess unless all of a sudden it's at very high levels of income, good X could become normal again, and then good Y could become inferior. You could have that situation, but you can't have both goods being inferior at the same time. That won't happen. So we've got an income expansion path here. We've got angle curves here. Two ways of looking at essentially the same idea. Only the angle curve identifies, it's much easier to identify how much income has changed because you could just read the numbers off the vertical axis. In this picture, if you want to identify how much income is changing, you would need to do a calculation based upon what you know about the prices and what these intercepts are. You could do it, it's very easy because the intercept here would just be income divided by the price of good X. Here's income divided by the price of good Y. So you can do it, it's not hard, but you've got to factor in the prices there. So now we have examined what impact a change in income is going to have. Let's think now about the effect of a change in price. Remember that a change in price causes the slope of the budget constraint to change. In a face-to-face -face class, at this point in the class, I would always ask my students, how many prices are there in this particular model that we're thinking about? And students almost every time will say there are two prices. There's the price of good X, there's the price of good Y. And that's technically true, but what all that matters is relative price. There's actually only one price. And that price is the price of good X divided by the price of good Y. You've taken several economics classes, and so you've heard somebody say over and over, relative prices, the relative price of good X, or the relative price of good Y. What they are saying is that what matters is the price of good X compared to the price of good Y. There's only one price, and we call it the relative price of good X. Relative price of good X. We could change it. We could put good Y on the horizontal axis down here, and then we would have PY over PX, and we'd call it the relative price of good Y. But by convention, at least in this class, I'm always going to put quantity of good X on the horizontal axis, quantity of good Y on the vertical axis, and the slope of the budget constraint is always going to be this price, price of good X, divided by the price of good Y. So there's actually only one price in this model. So we want to think about what happens when this relative price changes. Notice what we're saying is that Increasing the price of good X has the same impact as decreasing the price of good Y. Increasing the price of good X would make this fraction go up. Decreasing the price of good Y would also make the fraction go up. So that's what matters here. Let's figure out how we're going to work through this by just using kind of a, a simple example. Um, let's suppose that we think about a consumer that buys two goods, and let's make those two goods um, Coke and Pepsi. No, Coke and Pizza. We want them to be complements to each other, not substitutes. We'll do substitutes later on, but let's think about two goods, Coke and Pizza. Let's suppose the consumer has an income of $60, 
Let's suppose that the price of a Coke is $2 and the price of a pizza is $6. So this consumer has $60 to spend. Here are the two prices. And the consumer needs to decide how many Cokes they're going to buy and how many pizzas they're going to buy. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this, I'm going to erase this right hand side and then we'll draw out where the demand curve comes from. So let me clear that off. Let's start by thinking about what the consumer's budget constraint looks like. So the budget constraint says that whatever income they've got has got to be split between the two goods. So it's going to be determined by the amount they spend on Cokes, which is going to be $2 times the quantity of Cokes they buy, plus the amount they spend on pizzas, which is going to be $6 times the quantity of pizzas they buy. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph this with the quantity of pizzas on the vertical axis. So I want to solve for that. You could do it however you want, but as you're following along taking notes with what I'm doing here, um, we're going to put quantity of pizzas on the vertical axis. So I'm going to solve for QP. So I've got 6QP is equal to 60 minus 2 QC, I'm going to divide through by 6, that gives me QP is equal to um, 10 minus QC over 3. 2 over 6 would reduce to 1 third. So now let's draw this budget constraint. Now here's, here's, let me map out what we're going to do. We're going to see where a demand curve comes from. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up here on the top, I'm going to put our utility picture, and right below it I'm going to put a demand picture. We're going to actually draw the demand curve for Cokes here. So up here I'm going to put a utility picture, an indifference curve picture, and I'm going to stretch my horizontal axis out just a little bit. You'll see why here in a second. I'm going to put QC, quantity of Cokes there, quantity of pizzas here. This is why I solved for QP, because I want to be able to graph it in that space. Down here, I'm going to draw the demand curve for pizzas. So down here, I'm going to put the quantity, or excuse me, the, the demand curve for, the, for Coke. So I'm going to put QC down here. And remember that anytime we're drawing a demand curve, actually what we're going to draw is the inverse demand curve. We're going to have price up here. This is going to be the price of Cokes. So this is a utility picture, an indifference curve picture. It's got two goods on the axes. Quantity of Cokes, quantity of pizzas. This is going to be a demand picture. And a demand picture has the quantity of a good and its price. Okay. Now the reason we're graphing these one on top of the other is because my horizontal axes are the same, so any quantity that I identify in this picture, I can drop straight down to this picture. Let's draw this budget constraint. So this budget constraint has an intercept of 10, and it's got a slope of one third, so it goes down one over three. By the time it's gone down 10, it's gone over 30. So my initial budget constraint looks like this. There's the budget constraint based upon the amount of income the consumer has and the prices of the two goods. And let's verify that this makes sense. This point would be the point where they spend all of their money on pizzas. And if they've got $60 and a pizza costs $6, they could buy 10 pizzas. Another possibility is they spend all of their money on Cokes. Well, if they've got $60 and each Coke costs $2, then that means they could buy 30 Cokes if they want. Chances are they're probably not going to want all pizzas or all Cokes. That would be a corner solution. They're probably going to want an interior solution. And let's suppose they do. Let's suppose that we have an indifference curve and it's tangent right out here at a point that we'll call A, we'll call that indifference curve U1. Let's go ahead and label this BC1 so that as you're looking back, studying your notes, you can keep track of where we started. Let's suppose that this point 
corresponds to a point where they buy 18 Cokes and they buy four pizzas. Now let's verify that that is a point that would exhaust their income. If they buy 18 Cokes at $2 each, that's $36. That means they have $24 left to spend. Well, they've got $24 and they buy pizzas. That means they could buy four pizzas at $6 each. That would be $24. So four pizzas and 18 Cokes does indeed exhaust all of their income. That would be a point on their budget constraint. Now that also allows us to get a point on their demand curve because we know the price of Cokes is $2. Let's put that down here. The price of Cokes is two. And when the price of Cokes was $2, they bought 18 of them. They bought this many. Let's drop that straight down. There is a point right there on their demand curve for Cokes. Now, in order to find another point on the demand curve, what we need to do is consider a different price of Cokes. So let's double the price of Cokes. So at point A, let's write a little story over here. Point A, that's where we've got income equal to 60, the price of Cokes is equal to 2, and the price of pizzas is equal to 6. That means that the quantity of Cokes is equal to 18, and the quantity of pizzas was equal to 4. So pulling out this price of Cokes and quantity of Cokes, that's where we got this point on the demand curve. Now, let's double the price of Cokes. Let's consider a price of $4. Now, double the price of Cokes. So now what we've got is a situation where income is equal to 60, the price of a Coke is equal to 4, and the price of a pizza is equal to 6. Now, what's going to happen is this endpoint is not going to change. We haven't changed anything about pizzas. They've still got $60, and if they wanted to spend it all on pizzas, they could still buy 10 pizzas. But now, since the price of Cokes is $4, that means that if they've got $60 and they buy all Cokes, then they would only be able to buy 15 Cokes. 15 times 4 is $60. So this budget constraint we know is going to get steeper because the price of Cokes goes up. And the, the relative price is the price of this good on the horizontal axis. This thing has a relative price that looks like that. Price of Cokes divided by the price of pizzas. When the price of Cokes goes up, the slope gets bigger, so this thing is going to now come down and hit at 15. That means because the price of Cokes went up, that hurts the consumer. They can afford fewer bundles, so they're going to move to a lower indifference curve. Let's suppose they move now to a point where they're tangent right here at point uh, B. Let's suppose that they do indeed move to a lower indifference curve and there's indifference curve U2, here's budget constraint 2, and here's their new optimal point, point B. Let's suppose that that point corresponds to, um, let's say, 6 Cokes and 6 pizzas. Now let's verify that that is indeed a point on their budget constraint. If they buy six Cokes, that means they're going to spend $24. That would leave them $36 left over. And with that $36 at a price of $6 per pizza, they would be able to buy six. So that is indeed a point on the new budget constraint. It also gives us another point on the consumer's demand curve because now we know at a price of Cokes of $4, they're going to buy six Cokes. We can drop this straight down. This was 18. This is six. There is another point on what will end up being this consumer's inverse demand curve.
Let's do this again. Let's, uh, let's identify their new optimal point. So quantity of Cokes is now six. Quantity of pizzas is six. So notice that as the price of Cokes is going up, they're buying fewer Cokes and more pizzas. Quantity of Cokes went from 18 to six. Quantity of pizzas went from four to six. That's not surprising. As the price of one good that you buy goes up, the other good's getting cheaper in comparison. And you tend to start substituting towards it. So now let's do it again. Let's raise the price of, uh, make the price of Cokes, let's raise it by $2 again. Let's make um, the price of Cokes equal to $6 now. So now we've got income equal to 60, the price of Cokes is equal to 6, and the price of pizzas is equal to 6. Our budget constraint, this endpoint is not going to change. It's going to stay at 10, but now the endpoint here is going to change. It's going to end up going to 10 also. So we get a new budget constraint that's even steeper. It looks like that. There's budget constraint 3. And the consumer is going to move to an even lower indifference curve. Let's suppose that we end up at a point of tangency somewhere right up in here. Um, Let's make it somewhere right up in here. So we get a point of tangency right there. It's kind of hard to squeeze everything in there. I can't cross any indifference curve. So there's U3. The point of tangency is right up here. We'll call it point C. Let's suppose point C occurs at, uh, let's make it 8 and 2. And I realize these spaces aren't exactly right. That's fine. First, let's verify that that point C would exhaust all income. So if they buy eight pizzas at $6 each, that's $48. That leaves them $12 left over to buy Cokes. And they can buy two at a price of $6. So point C does indeed exhaust all of the income. And it also gets us a new point on the inverse demand curve because now we know that at a price of six, they're going to want to buy two. And so here's another point on the inverse demand curve. You can see if we connect these points, we get an inverse demand curve for Cokes that looks just like that. There's the demand curve for Cokes. So it illustrates a couple of things. The first and most obvious is that we can easily use this utility maximization picture to figure out exactly why demand curves look the way they do, why they are downward sloping. The other thing, the less obvious thing, it's obvious once you see it, but it's not as obvious before you take a look at it, demand curves typically are not linear. Now in, in this class we've talked about the fact that when we're solving a, a demand supply problem, I'm going to be giving you linear demand and supply curves. But now you should be able to see that based on how this works, the demand curve is typically not going to be linear. So this gives you an idea of where the demand curve comes from. What we're doing here is we're changing the price of Cokes. Remember that the, the end points, the horizontal intercepts that are important in this picture are not these. Remember this is just the end point of the budget constraint. Same with that, that's the end point of a budget constraint and that's also the end point of a budget constraint. Those are not the numbers that you're looking for down in this picture. Down in this picture we've got the quantity of good C consumed and so what we're looking for down here are the coordinates, the horizontal coordinates of these points A, B, and C, which are 18, 6, and 2. So on any homework or test that I give you where I ask you to draw a demand curve, if I were to give you a picture like this, you need to make sure that you can pull the correct numbers off of this top picture and bring them down into the bottom picture. You want to bring the coordinates of these points not the endpoints of the budget constraint. What we want to do now is think about what happens now that we know where a demand curve comes from. 
we want to take a look at what happens if preferences change. So what if, what if, if preferences change, notice that what we're saying is that the entire utility function is going to move. It, it could become steeper in one direction or less steep in a direction. It could switch more of the mass of the utility function from one side to the other. So I'm going to clear this off and then we'll take a look at that. In order to explore what happens when preferences change, I'm going to kind of reproduce some of the picture that I just took away here. So what I'm going to do is let's draw the utility picture and the demand picture, but let's not put quite as many details into either of them. That way it'll be an easier picture to understand what's going on. So we had the quantity of Cokes here, quantity of pizzas, and we had an initial budget constraint that looked something like this, and we had an initial point of tangency that was right there at point A, we called it. And so then we dropped that point down, and that gave us at a price of $2, I don't need to put that on, that gave us an, a point right there, one of the points that we were used to draw this demand curve, and then we changed the price of Cokes and that made the budget constraint steeper and we ended up at a point like point B. Again, I'm not going to draw the indifference curve being tangent there, I'm just going to show you where it's tangent. And then that gave us at a price of four, that gave us another point down here on the demand curve for Cokes. Let's label this, remember this was the price of Cokes quantity of Cokes down there. And then we changed it again and made, changed the price of Cokes again. This became even steeper and we moved to some point up here like point C. And we dropped that point down and that was at a price of six now. It was a quantity, I think it was something like two. And we drew the, connected those points, that gave us a demand curve for Cokes that looked like that. Let's call it demand curve one. That's where we started, A, B, and C. Now, let's suppose that all of a sudden the consumer's preferences changed. The preferences are different. Now, let's think back to where that shows up. If you remember back to your principles of macro, principles of micro, the beginning of this class, we talked about the determinants of demand. Notice that what we are doing is we are thinking about one of those determinants of demand. What happens if your preferences for some good change? Back in a principles class and even at the beginning of this class, we didn't really talk about you know, what that meant. That's kind of where we started. Now we know that there's something that, that physical that we're kind of, we can kind of think about and that is we're thinking about the utility function. What does the shape of your utility function tell us? Well, it tells us your preferences. And so let's suppose that your utility function changed. Let's suppose we, we took this big mound, this three-dimensional utility function, we pushed it up in this direction a little bit so that at every price, you liked Coke a little less than before. Well, what that means is if we were to push this this utility function in this direction, then these points of tangencies would move from, say, point A to a little bit to the left of it. Let's, uh, let me put it in a different color. Let's suppose that it moved not from point, or moved from point A to maybe a point like point D. So now this point of tangency, instead of being right there at A, maybe now your indifference curve is just tangent at D. And then maybe instead of point B, it would be tangent right up here at point E. So there's a, a tangency. And instead of point C, maybe it would be tangent right up here at point F. So there's a tangency. And what that means is that at all three of these prices, instead of you wanting to buy this quantity at A, you would want to buy this quantity back here. When I drop that one down, it comes right here. So at a price of $2, instead of wanting this quantity, you want it a little less than that. And at a price of $4, instead of wanting this quantity at B, you want it a little less than that. 
It was right there at point E. So at $4, it was right there. And at a price of $6, instead of wanting this quantity at C, you wanted this quantity right there at F. And so we had that. Now you can see why we describe a change in your preferences as simply shifting your demand curve. If we connected these new points, your demand curve will have shifted to the left. All right, there's D2 now, and what happened was that demand curve shifted to the left. But now you know what comes before that. You, rather than just knowing that a, a change in your preferences is going to shift your demand curve to the right or to the left, you know that a change in your preferences shows up as a movement of this utility function. And when the utility function moves, your point of tangencies are going to be different. Okay. What we want to do now is we want to break down a change in price into both the income and substitution effects. If you think back to principles class, we tell you that demand curves slope downward because of the income and substitution effects. And we just kind of leave it at that. And you probably, as we were working through this demand curve exercise right before we did this, you might have thought, hey, I think I'm seeing where this substitution effect comes from. As, the, as these budget constraints get steeper, it means that we're moving to tangencies that have to be up in this direction. And you're right, that, that's part of where the substitution effect is showing up. What we want to do is break it down even more, and we want to see exactly what this income effect looks like and the substitution effect. So remember that a subst the substitution effect, the definition of it is, let's think about it in terms of an a, a increase in price. When the price of something you buy goes up, other goods become cheaper in comparison, and you tend to substitute towards the other good. We saw exactly that in this example. As Cokes became more expensive, as we started out at a price of a Coke at $2 and then made it 4 and then made it 6 the consumer was substituting away from Cokes towards pizzas. That's the substitution effect. The income effect says that as the price of something you buy goes up, you can buy less stuff because it has a bad impact on your income. And so that's part of the reason you buy less. And that also was happening, although we didn't really identify where that was in the picture. So what we want to do here is really be specific about where those show up. Now, let's start by talking about the fact that these things, the income and substitution effect, are not visible out there in the real world. These are things that, if we can look at a utility function represented by your indifference curves, then I can show you where the income and substitution effects are. But out there in the real world, we don't separately identify them. We don't observe them independent of each other. We observe what we call the total effect. But the total effect is composed of both of the income and substitution effects. Okay, so let's review something real quick. Let's just put um, quantity of x up here quantity of y, let's put a budget constraint, I'm going to decrease the price of good x, so I'm going to make this my initial budget constraint, that way when I decrease the price of good x, it pivots out like that. So let's put an initial point of tangency between my budget constraint and my indifference curve, it's going to be something like that, there's indifference curve u1, there's my initial point of tangency at point a, Let's drop down the coordinates of that so that we can see the amount of good x and the amount of good y. I'm not going to write anything, but those dotted lines will tell us that this is the amount of good x, that's the amount of good y. Now, let's, so let's make our story here start at A. Let's suppose the price of good x falls. Suppose price of good x falls. Now remember, the slope of the budget constraint is the relative price of good x. It's the price of good x divided by the price of good y. So if the price of good x goes down, remember the slope looks like this, px over py. If the price of 
good x goes down, our numerator gets smaller, the fraction gets smaller. So the, so the slope gets smaller, it pivots out like this. This will be budget constraint 2. And this is going to allow the consumer to move to a higher indifference curve. Let's suppose we move to a new indifference curve that's tangent. There's indifference curve U2. Suppose it's tangent right up here at point B. And I made point B to the northeast of point A. Let's drop down the coordinates of that. We can see that when the price of good X goes down, the consumer buys more good X. And notice that they also buy more of good Y. So this, so we, this leads us to point B. We have an increase in the quantity of good X and an increase in the quantity of good Y. This movement from here to there, we call the total effect on good X. This is the total effect. Same here, we call this the total effect on good Y. We're going to break down the total effect into the two components. The two components are the income and substitution effects. Now, we're only going to do it for the good on the horizontal axis. We're not going to break this one down. It's on the vertical axis. It's, it's easier to do when it's on the horizontal axis. So what we're going to think about here is breaking up the total effect. This is equal to the income effect plus the substitution effect. From, from just what we've got right there, we can't see how much of it is the income effect and how much of it is the substitution effect. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to start by thinking about isolating the income effect. And in the course of doing that, we're also going to see where the substitution effect shows up. So let's, let me draw another picture here. This picture is going to be very similar to this one, only I'm going to, I'm going to make things a little bit more spaced out here. Um, so let's do this. Let's, uh, let's put again QX down here, QY up here. Let's put our budget constraint. I'm going to make it kind of steep because I'm going to decrease the price of good X so that it can pivot out that way. Let's start by putting our point of tangency somewhere down here. So draw your budget constraint. Have it come down here. Just touch or draw your indifference curve. Have it just touch that budget constraint and move off there. There's indifference curve U1, budget constraint BC1, our initial point of tangency right there at point A. So we're going to start at A. Let's put our story down here. Start at A. And let's have the price of good X decline. Now, let's drop down our quantity. Let's call that, um, I'm going to call it QXA. That's where we're starting. I'm not going to worry about quantity of Y, but it would be right there. Now, I'm going to suppose that the price of good X falls. When the price of good X falls, this budget constraint is going to pivot out like this. I'm going to pivot it quite a bit because I want to have lots of space here so that we can see. So there's my new budget constraint, BC2. And let's put our point, a new point of tangency somewhere out here. It doesn't matter exactly where you put it. Put it to the right of point A. So let's just put it somewhere right out in here. There's point B. Indifference curve U2. Price of good X falls. That leads us to budget constraint BC2, and we get point B. And let's identify the quantity of good X there. This is quantity of good X at point B. Now that 
is what we would call the total effect. That's the same thing as what I've done here in this picture, except I spaced it out more in that picture. So this is the total effect. When the price of good X fell, the consumer bought more good X. Total effect. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break that total effect up into the part that's due to the substitution effect and the part that's due to the income effect. So now let's think about starting at point B. What's happened is that the price of good X has gone down. The consumer was now able to move to a higher indifference curve and they enjoy more utility. U2 is greater than U1. The consumer is higher up on their utility function. What we want to do is we want to remove the improvement in utility. So what I want to do is I want to consider starting at point B at the new set of prices and I want to think about what would happen if we took this budget constraint BC2 and we pulled it back towards the origin. As we pull it back towards the origin, if we took a budget constraint and we move it parallel to itself, that means that we're changing income. We already looked at what happened we, when we changed income. We looked at the income expansion path and every time we gave the consumer more income, their budget constraint moved out parallel to itself. Well, if we take income away from the consumer, the budget constraint moves in parallel to itself. So I'm going to remove the income effect. Any, because the price of good X fell, it's like this consumer has more income. I'm going to take that income away from them. And I'm going to leave them. I'm going to take enough income away from them to return them to their original utility level. Okay? So if I take budget constraint BC2 and I pull it back and I keep it parallel to itself, and I move it back, move it back, move it back, I'm taking income away, I can move it back until we get just tangent to the original indifference curve. And notice that because this budget constraint is less steep than BC1, my new point of tangency is going to be someplace right over in here, to the right and down from point A. So when I take this budget constraint BC2 and I pull it back, I end up at a point, I'm going to draw a little dotted line here to indicate that I've moved budget constraint BC2 back. So this budget constraint, it's a hypothetical budget constraint, has the same slope as that one. Now I'm not so sure I got it just right in my picture here. Maybe it should be something more like that. But notice my point of tangency has to be down and to the right of point A because Budget constraint BC2 is not as steep as BC1. I'm going to call that point A prime. Now you may need to go back and rewatch that because I can tell you when I sat in a class and, and somebody went through that the first time, I thought, oh my gosh, I have no idea what just happened there. It took me reading the chapter in the book or reading that section in the book several times before I finally said, okay, I think I see what's going on. So all we're doing, starting from point B, is we're taking the income effect away from them. We're, we're removing income, we're leaving prices at the new price, and we're removing income until we take them back to where they were utility-wise at the very beginning. They don't care whether they're at point A or point A prime, right? But when we've done that, if we drop this down and we call this QXA prime, this movement from right here to right there, that is the income effect. That's the part that allowed them to move to a higher indifference curve. The income effect is the part that allows you to climb up higher on your utility function. Now that we've got A prime up here, you should be able to easily see that the movement from A to A prime is the substitution effect. So this movement from here to there, that's the substitution effect. Notice that the thing that caused that was simply that the relative prices changed. If we start at point A 
and we make the relative price of good X lower, then that's going to move us around, the utility, around this indifference curve, and we're going to move to a new point of tangency right here at A prime. And we have not allowed the income effect to move them up there to that higher indifference curve. But this movement A to A prime, that part is due to the change in the slope of the budget constraint. Okay, so A to A prime is the substitution effect. That, that moves them around the indifference curve. And then A prime up to B is the income effect. That is the effect that is like having more money to spend. So what we've done here is we've broken up the movement from A to B into two chunks. A to A prime represents the substitution effect. A prime to B represents the income effect. The substitution effect is always going to show up as the movement around a single indifference curve. You're substituting away from good Y towards good X because good X is getting relatively cheaper. When this ratio goes down, that's the same thing as saying good Y is getting relatively more expensive. That's why we're substituting away from good Y. So what I want to do now is clear this off and then do this instead of doing a price increase or a price decrease, let's do it with a price increase and then I'll do it a, a little bit more concisely and I think it'll be easier to kind of see what we're looking for here. So let's clear this off and we'll do this again. Let's draw a very similar picture. QX, QY. This time I want to decrease or increase the price of good X. So I'm going to start with a budget constraint that's out like this. That way when I increase the price of good X, I've got room for it to pivot in this direction. So this is budget constraint 1, BC1. Let's put a point of tangency out here. It doesn't matter where you put your point of tangency. But I can tell you that it's easier if you put your point of tangency down here on this end than it is to put it up here on this end. If you put it on this end, then when this budget constraint pivots, if it's started out on this end, you can't pivot it enough to get it very far away. If you start it down here, then when this budget constraint pivots, you've got lots of space to work with. So I always recommend that students put it down in this direction. So we'll call that point A. Here's a indifference curve U1. Here is the initial quantity of good A, or excuse me, quantity of good X. We'll call it QXA. So we're going to start at A. Let me just put a, a part of a story here. Start, uh, I don't want to, uh, that's okay, start. At A. I need to leave space there to write the income and substitution effects, but I'll, I'll squeeze it in there. So there's where we start. Now let's increase the price of good X. Suppose price of good X goes up. Now this is going to be bad for the consumer. When the price of something you buy goes up, that's like having a cut in your income. So this is going to move them to a lower indifference curve. So I'm going to make this, I'm going to have it be a fairly large increase in the price of good X. So I'm going to make this thing pivot down a lot. There's budget constraint 2, BC2. Now let's put our new point of tangency. And again, it doesn't matter exactly where, but I think if you had an indifference curve that was fairly consistent with this one, your point of tangency is going to be somewhere right in here. So if we put a point of tangency something like that. That seems to be pretty consistent. There would be indifference curve U2, point of tangency at B. So you can see this increase in the price of good X causes us to buy a lot less good X. Here's QXB. This movement from QXA to QXB, that whole movement, that's the total effect. Part of it's going to end up being the income effect, and part of it's going to end up being the substitution effect. So price of good X goes up. That leads us to point B. Now, 
this price increase caused a negative income effect for the consumer. So what we want to do is the opposite of what we just thought about doing. We want to think about restoring the consumer to their original utility level, this utility level U1. Well, in order to restore them to the initial utility level, I need to give this consumer some income to get them back onto this original indifference curve. But I want to do that at the new prices. So if I take this new indifference curve, and I'm going to orient my notes here to the same slope as the new budget constraint. So if I take this new budget constraint, I think I said indifference curve just a second ago. If I take this new budget constraint, and I think about giving them income, not changing prices, but giving them income, and giving them enough income to get them up to that original indifference curve, then it would occur someplace up here. If I had shifted that new budget constraint enough to get them back up to the original indifference curve, then A prime, it should be A prime, would be somewhere right up there. So what's happening here is I'm taking this budget constraint BC2 and I'm moving it back tangent to the indifference curve U1. This has the same slope as this does. Now I've got everything I need. So this movement from B to A prime. So if I drop this point down here, let's, let's start, let's call this QX A prime. So when the price goes up, Consumer is going to substitute away from good X towards good Y. That substitution effect is shown as the movement from A to A prime. Utility is not changing. So this movement around this indifference curve from A to A prime, that's the substitution effect. So this much of it, that's our substitution effect. I don't care if you draw it going that direction, or if you were to put the arrow on that end, I'm not really that interested. I think it's useful to know that if we start at A and the price of good X goes up, they substitute away from good X. So technically the arrow should be on this end, but if you were to put an arrow on either end, let's say both ends, then that's telling me that you recognize that this much of the change is the substitution effect. And then this much of the change is the income effect. That increase in the price of good X has caused them to move to a lower indifference curve. Moving to a new indifference curve is always caused by the income effect. So this much right there, that's the income effect. Oops. Let's talk about a couple of things. Hopefully you recognize that A and A prime are always on the same indifference curve. If you work through this problem and you accidentally shift the wrong budget constraint, and that's a mistake that I sometimes see students make, what you always want to do is you always want to take the second budget constraint and move it back tangent to the original indifference curve. The wrong thing to do is to take the initial budget constraint and move it out tangent to the new indifference curve. That's the wrong thing to do. In that case, A prime and B will be on the same indifference curve for in your picture. If you've drawn a picture and you don't see A and A prime on the same indifference curve, and that's why we call them A and A prime, then you've done it wrong. B should always be by itself on its own indifference curve. If you've got that, then you should be in good shape. So there's the income and substitution effects. Let's talk about the size of the income and substitution effects. Let's start with the substitution effect. Size of the substitution effect. What determines how big the substitution effect is? Well, it has to do with the amount of curvature of the indifference curves. And we already talked about that in earlier on in a uh, previous video. We talked about the curvature of the indifference curves ha telling us something about how much substitutability there is. So if I were to draw two pictures, let's draw two little pictures here. 
and let's draw a budget constraint in each picture about the same. Let's put QX here, QY, QX, QY. I'm going to draw indifference curves for do, two different consumers, let's say. This indifference curve I'm going to come, have come down here be tangent and curve very rapidly. Point A. This one, I'm going to have it come down, touch at point A, but then curve off very gradually. Okay, so there's point A. Now, let's suppose we decrease the price of good X. When we decrease the price of good X, our budget constraint's gonna pivot out like this. And then we're gonna take that new budget constraint and we're gonna pull it back tangent. Well, when we do that, if we do it with this one, pivot it out and then pull it back, our point of tangency is going to end up somewhere down here, A prime. Let's do the same point of, or the same slope for the new budget constraint. And you can see that because I've made this one curve off very rapidly, that when I find the same place or the place where this budget constraint and that budget constraint, which have the same slope, would be tangent, A prime is going to be very close to A over here because it curves so rapidly. Because this one's got a nice smooth sloping curve to it, it curves slowly. A prime is very far away from A compared to this picture. So the size of the substitution effect, how much they substitute away, there's very little substitution effect here compared to over here. There's a lot of substitution. So the, the more curvature you give it, the more curvature, the smaller the substitution effect. The more curvature there is, the smaller the substitution effect. Let's talk about the income effect, the size of the income effect. The size of the income effect depends upon, if we think about the price of one good changing, it depends upon the portion of the consumer's budget that is devoted to that good. So it's determined by how much of the two goods the consumer consumes before the price change. Let me show you a picture of that. Let's do the same thing here. I'll draw two pictures. Um, let's draw, let's put QX down here, QX, QY, QY. I'm going to increase the price. So let's make our budget constraint go like that. That way when I increase the price, I've got room to pivot it. Now, let, I'm going to increase the price of good X. In this picture, let's have the consumer consume a lot of good X relative to Y. So their, their point of tangency is going to be right down here. So they consume a lot of good X, not so much good Y. There's point A. This consumer, I'm going to have them consume a relatively small amount of good X. Let's make our point of tangency somewhere up here. There's point A. Again, two different consumers with different preferences. Now, let's increase the price of good X by the same amount in each picture. And we're going to end up with a new point of tangency. It's going to be someplace down in here, say point B. New point of tangency is going to be somewhere right down here. I'll say that's point B. And you can already see that when we take that budget constraint and we move it back tangent to our original indifference curve, A prime is going to give us a very small, that should be A prime. Here, it's going to give us a very big indifference curve, or excuse me, a very big income effect. There would be A prime, oops, A prime, your income effect would be that big in that picture. 
and it would only be this big in that picture. And the reason that that happens is that the farther down here that you put your point of tangency, the more you've got to move to go from that new indifference curve back to the old one. The income effect will be bigger if you're spending a bigger chunk of your, of your money on the good whose price changes. What we're going to do now is we're going to think about what this looks like for an inferior good, and it turns out that it's actually kind of interesting. So we'll do that in our next video.